Last but not least, I think you've met Mark Settle, my colleague in America. He's going to come out and talk about navigating the automation journey, and in particular, the do's and don'ts of successful automation. So please welcome back to the stage, Mark Settle. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, just one couple of thank yous before we begin. First of all, a big round of applause to our host for today, Mr. John Holtz. I realize I'm the last session between you and Prague or, or your uh, quick rest or whatever it may be, but uh, if you'll bear with me. Uh, one more thank you uh, really to all of the logistics behind our conference today. Uh, so there's a, a large team, not only of Legito employees, but uh, of those who put together this great stage, are running things backstage, helping with our live stream, uh, our marketing team. If we could just give them a, a quick round of applause, I, I think that would be great. All right, so I thought uh, since I'm the last session of the day, I get an opportunity to, to, to hopefully keep you awake. We'll see. So I thought I'd do that by telling a personal story. If you were at, this, at the conference last year, I kind of embarrassed my, my daughter in absentia, so today I'm going to embarrass myself a little bit and tell you a story uh, about myself versus the washing machines. That should be a plural, really. So, so I just this is a, kind of a little running thing, a joke in my family uh, with me and washing machines. So I had to start at round one, which happened about 20 years ago. Uh, my wife and I were in our mid-20s, uh, so if you're doing your math, I'm in my mid-40s. Somehow my wife has fuzzy math, and she's like in her early 30s, but... Uh, Round one happened in our mid-20s. We bought our first home, and this home was built in the 1960s, and it had, I think, the original dishwasher in it. Uh, so, so it came time to replace that. I was young and wanted to do it on my own, poor, so I wanted to do it on my own. Uh, so I bought a new washing machine, pulled the old one out, was putting the new one in, and was doing mostly great. Uh, had hooked up the water. Got everything right, turned the water on, everything looked good. And I can't remember the reason why, but for some reason I, I forgot to do something, had to unhook everything and, and, uh, and take it apart. So I, I'm starting to take it apart. My wife says, you turned the water off, right? And I said, oh, yeah, I turned the water off. And so I'm unhooking it. As you unscrew the water line, you'd think if the water was on that some water would start dripping and you'd know the water's still on. But the seal was tight enough that uh, that didn't happen. So when I finally got it loose enough for it to come off, and the water was on all of the way, and it's hot water for a dishwasher. It looked a little bit like a cartoon, right? The hose is going everywhere, the kitchen's flooding, we're grabbing towels, trying to turn off the water. It was a little bit comedic. Uh, so, so round one went to the dishwasher. So uh, did not, ha we, I, I should say I won because eventually it was correct, but it, it was uh, just a, an interesting journey. So round two. So round two is uh, five to 10 years later, I don't know exactly how long, but we had moved uh, across the United States to a new location, bought a, a new home. Also had maybe the original dishwasher in the home. Home was built in the 80s. Uh, it was about 20 years old, and so we decided to replace this dishwasher. Uh, so this time, hey, I've done this before. It should be easy, right? So, so I'm pulling the old dishwasher out, and I've disconnected the water line, and the water line won't come out. So I'm down on the floor trying to pull this water line out. The water's off, thankfully. And so I, I am successful in that. So I'm like, oh, great, the water's off. This is good. And so I'm yanking and pull hard. All of a sudden, the water line comes really fast. Underneath the dishwasher was a sharp piece of metal. So if you ever see me up close, I got a nice scar on my thumb here where I just gashed it underneath the dishwasher, a little bit of blood everywhere. Should have gone to the doctor and got stitches. But so I got a nice scar from that. So round two, dishwasher, right? So I'm, I'm 0 for 2 uh, with dishwashers. Uh, round three happened just last year, and uh, so we're, we're at a, a new home. So we built a new home four years ago, three years ago, uh, four years ago. And this dishwasher, a new dishwasher, so you think, oh, I'm good for years. I don't have to have round three for a long time. Uh, but it was Whirlpool, and I'm not a fan of Whirlpool. Uh, we, we didn't like it very much, and then it had an issue that would have required service, and so we decided to just replace it. Uh, this time... I had learned from my mistakes. And, uh, and so round three was successful. So no, no issues, no gashes, no water spraying everywhere. It was actually quite easy, both because of my experience and because over the 20 years, uh, dishwashers have improved quite a bit. And I would say if you're 
dishwasher shopping, get a Bosch. They're the best. All right, so, uh, so round three went to me. So the reason I wanted to share this experience is as I'm talking about no navigating your automation journey, it is that. It's a journey, right? And so there are waypoints along the way, things that we, we learn. And so we experience builds success. So if we're doing something for the first time, we don't have as much experience, and, and we might make those mistakes that spray water everywhere. We might uh, cut ourselves, and, and, and we might get to our success eventually, but that journey becomes a little bit challenging. So those experiences actually help us be better. By the third time I, I built that dish or put that dishwasher in, I was much more proficient at it. Not only that, but the technology had improved as well, so it helped me as well. Uh, and, and so as we talk about this today, I'm going to share some of my own do's and don'ts uh, about implementing your automation project. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to say today I think has really been said uh, from, the stand, uh, from the pulpit up here. So uh, I'm grateful uh, for all of those people who shared just fantastic presentations today uh, of how you're applying a lot of these principles already within your business. And so I want to share a few of those do's and don'ts. So we're going to start with some of, well, I have a don't and then a do often uh, So in these slides. So first, don't. Don't do it all at once. And I think we've heard this multiple times uh, today. Uh, if you try to do everything at once, and I'm talking like waterfall approach to a project, right? You're gonna, I, I have 800 documents I need to automate. I'm going to do all 800 and then release them to my users. That's a terrible idea, right? Uh, it, it does a lot of things. It magnifies the mistakes that you make. Uh, it causes project fatigue, which is a real thing. Um, and, and it just, it, it, it's harder to focus on what you actually need to accomplish. And you lose project excitement because you take too long to do it. So you don't get this opportunity to build excitement for what you're doing, uh, both with your project team and, and the business that you're deploying it to. Uh, I, I had to put the, the picture of everything, uh, everything everywhere all at once, fantastic movie, highly recommend if you haven't seen it. But you feel like you're, if you do it all at once, you just feel like you're getting pulled in every direction and, and it makes things really difficult. So what you do want to do is get a quick win. Uh, so you want to build excitement early. Uh, you want to have early impact. Uh, and so you want to build that excitement within the business and your project team. But not only that, if you get a quick win and you do kind of a small project to start, whether it be a pilot or a specific part of your uh, overall planned implementation, then what you also get is you get to learn from that. So you get to you know, adapt to what went right, what went wrong, what you need to do. And so if you're going to do that quick win, then the, you need to pick your high value content first. High value content is defined differently at different businesses, right? It, it, it might be high use, it might be your higher complexity, it, it might be the content that just excites your users the most. It might not even be the, the highest value or the highest use, but it's the one you're going to get the, the biggest win from that you choose first. Uh, so you need to decide what's high value for you and go after that first. Uh, I, I think that's critical uh, in that first iteration of your implementation. And, and, and then as a part of that, leverage your wins. So I'll talk more about publicizing internally and those things as well, but you want to leverage your wins as early as you can uh, to get people excited. All right, so don't repeat your mistakes. Charles had a great uh, Albert Einstein quote. This may not actually be Albert Einstein, but I think it's largely contributed, uh, attributed to him. Uh, but he says, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the uh, different results. Uh, I, I feel like this happens at my house. I have young children, and, and this happens at my house often, right? We, we are insane because we're repeating the same things over and over again, and, and we're gonna, we got to stop the insanity, right? So, but it's the same in our business. If we, if we created a problem in our last iteration of our project and we're doing the exact same thing again, uh, then what are we doing? And Paulo uh, Coelho, who's a Brazilian writer, says when you repeat a mistake, it's not a mistake anymore, it's a decision, uh, right? So now you're just choosing to do it wrong. Uh, so so eva self evaluation in that project process is key to not repeating your mistakes. So do, uh, you know, this goes along with getting that quick win, but do iterate and learn. So after you have the quick win, win again. Uh, so if you're going to implement good procedures with the right people, uh, then, then it helps you have that iterative process. Uh, but I think we see a lot of people implementing Agile and they're sprinting and, and they divide the work up into sprints, but they miss a very important feedback step or a self-evaluation self step uh, in that process. So if you're, if you're iterating, make sure part of that iteration is getting feedback, whether it be from your customers or just sitting down as a project team and evaluating, this is what went right, this is what went wrong. 
how are we going to change for this next sprint or this next iteration in our delivery. Uh, a little statistic up, uh, up there, but agile or iterative approach, uh, those projects are statistically two times more uh, successful uh, than waterfall projects, right? So they just break things down, allow you to adapt. Uh, the other thing I'd say is measure your failures and successes. So if you've got this feedback loop at, through an iterative process, then make sure you're measuring that as best you can so that when you get to the next iteration, you know, did, not only did we hopefully not repeat our same mistakes, but we have some way to validate that uh, and know if we are or not. All right, don't expect perfection. So I got my spilled milk up there. There's a uh, kind of a, a nice American phrase, don't cry over spilled milk. Uh, so don't, you work to not repeat your mistakes, but, right, mistakes are gonna happen, right? And that's just, people are human, you're gonna see mistakes in your automation process. You're gonna see mistakes coming from your SMEs. You're gonna see mistakes in the planning, uh, in the project management. All of those places that we're, we're human, we make those mistakes. So as they, as they happen, uh, you know, don't, don't focus on the mistake, focus on what the solution can be to that mistake. So have that feedback loop, have a discussion about it. Don't, don't, blame, don't play the blame game, but uh, sit down at a table and discuss what went wrong and how do we how do we solve it? Uh, and I think an important part of that is having that be part of the process and expecting that there are gonna be mistakes, right? I, I, I've worked in teams where it, everything blows up because there's a mistake and they're not willing to talk about it uh, and we should expect that as part of our, our project. Uh, we should plan for it uh, and understand that we're gonna have to do some rework sometimes. We're gonna have to adjust uh, to those mistakes that will happen. So don't expect perfection. Uh, none of us are perfect and, and we probably won't ever be. Uh, we're just gonna work towards it. All right, so I, I talked about that feedback loop. Request your feedback regularly. And whether this is in testing your content, so if you're doing document automation, you wanna have an issue tracking system that allows you to get feedback uh, back easily. And it, even you want a feedback loop for uh, documents that are live and, and being used by your customers, so I thought uh, you know, Luigi talked about some, some great feedback that he was getting in his presentation, and, I, and I'm sure many of you do this. Uh, so having that process to get that feedback and then know how to work off of it is, is very important. Uh, if you're releasing new content, whether it be changes to an existing content or new content, have a sign-off process on it so that you're getting the feedback that you need before it goes live, everybody's comfortable before it goes live. Uh, publish a process to get that feedback after content is live as well. Uh, make sure that's documented for your users. They know who to go to and how to give feedback. Uh, this is, you know, uh, we've heard this said uh, up here multiple times today, but if the customer is really who we're doing all of this for and we're not facilitating their ability to give us feedback to know how to do it better for them, then we're missing a huge part of the success uh, in our journey. All right, don't ever think it's one and done. So uh, in, specifically in document automation world, this is where I've seen the biggest mistakes by, by some of my clients uh, as I've worked with this over the years is that they think a template, I'm gonna build my template, I'm gonna put it out there, and I'm done. Uh, if you think that, it feels a bit like this. It comes back from the dead, right? It does, because no document is static. Uh, you know, when you build these templates, laws change, subject matter experts think, oh, well, now that I know it can do this, I would also like it if it did that. Right? So you have additional features that come that are desirable uh, from your end users. So you should plan for change, right? So you plan for the change. You wanna turn into the, the beautiful butterfly uh, that, that he does. But uh, you know, plan for that change as a part of your planning process. So not only do you, does your iteration include what's my new template development or my new document automation that I'm gonna do in this next phase or, or whatever, integrations and other things I might be planning in, as a part of my implementation, but I should always have a budget for maintenance of that automation. And whether that be automation with workflows, automation with documents, automation with whatever it may be, those things are living. And if you're not budgeting for that maintenance of that content, then, then you're missing it. Uh, and and you're, gonna, you're really gonna feel uh, the weight of that uh, when you're trying to get new things done and you still have to maintain uh, the things that are changing. So you have to plan for that. Uh, automation leads to the users asking for more, and this is fantastic, right? This is what we want them to do. Uh, it, it helps them increase their efficiency. It helps us reduce error, uh, reduce error and, and reduce the risk. So we want them to ask for more. 
Uh, so if we're not planning for that more, uh, then we're missing it. So we definitely want to make sure we're, we're planning for change and build a process for those change requests, right? So that you have a process to both uh, know how to budget your time for them, but also if, if they're coming in uh, a lot, you're going to have to budget your time and say, this we can do now and this we can do later. Uh, so you have to have a, a kind of a, a process to approve and, and manage those requests that come in. All right, so don't miss key stakeholders. This is uh, a, a, another one I've seen commonly. So uh, for Charles maybe talked a little, so if you're doing a larger project, so if you're a citizen developer, you're, you're all of it, right? So you, you kind of do your own project. But if you're building a, a project that's gonna release the software within your business, um, it's not quite like a citizen developer. There has to be some of your key stakeholders involved. There has to be a business owner uh, so it doesn't matter how good your plan is, if you don't have the right people involved, it's going to fail. So it, you know, if you don't have executive sponsorship, if you don't have the right budgeting, uh, if you don't have a project owner, then, then you're not going to have success. It doesn't matter how good your plan is uh, or how good the solution is. Uh, you, you have to have those people. So you have to build the right team. So know all of the roles of, of who you need and ensure their commitment and ensure or require their time. Right, that should be part of your planning process. So if, if you have subject matter experts who are gonna provide markup of your content uh, that you're gonna use in automation, then you have to have their time. And so that expectation has to be set up front uh, and, and has to be done. That's maybe one of the most difficult things and it's different in different industries. Probably the hardest in legal because your subject matter expert is often a billing attorney, right? And so trying to get some of their time away from billing is, is extremely difficult or in a corporate legal environment. Uh, but anybody, uh, even if you're working in HR, compliance, banking, the people who are those subject matter experts, they're busy, right? And, but they have to realize to get the savings and the, and the risk reduction that they're going to get from automation, they have to invest time uh, to help provide the subject matter expertise. And I think that's probably the, one of the most common failures in an automation project is not getting enough time and not getting enough um, buy-in from those subject matter experts. They, they are critical. Uh, understand what your constraints are with your team as well. So you require their time, but you might be constrained by how much time they can give. So don't plan to go more aggressively than, than, than they have time, right? So you have to adapt your plan to them uh, because they're really key to having success. Uh, I put some kind of, in a document automation project, these are kind of the four, uh, at, at least, roles that I would always expect to see in a document automation. You've got your SME, you've got the person actually building the template. There are rare cases where those are the same person, but usually they are different. So because of that, you, you have to have good communication between those resources. You'll always, hopefully, always have a project manager uh, that's overseeing that. PMO is, is critical to success. And, and then a project sponsor, somebody who owns this back to the business. Uh, so those four roles, they can be combined by, to one person sometimes, but pardon me, they all have to exist. Don't overcomplicate things. Uh, you know, I, I think Charles, a few of you have mentioned this today. I, I like Charles talking about that uh, dichotomy of uh, we want to make it simple, but we can't make it too simple, right? So complex things have to have some level of complexity. Uh, so you can't just go on keep it simple, stupid, that old principle. It's not quite that simple. Uh, I like this quote by Richard Branson. I think I put it up in my deck last year. But complexity is your enemy. Any fool can make things complicated. It's hard to keep things simple. So it's finding the balance to find it, keep it simple enough. Uh, if you've got complex things that need to be automated, there's going to be complexity. But where can you reduce the complexity uh, that, that is unnecessary? And we do tend to overcomplicate things naturally ourselves sometimes. Like we, we just make it harder than it has to be. Uh, so having that as kind of a part of your process and thinking, are we overcomplicating? Do we have to do this? What value does this part of my automation actually bring to us as a business versus this? Uh, you know, can I build one massive template with a ton of logic in it to change based on the options? Or can I build three different templates that really make it a little bit, uh, you know, simpler for our end users and a little bit simpler in the maintenance side? So sometimes those decisions are made uh, to just reduce the complexity to help you maintain your content in a better way. 
define your success and your process really well. So uh, you want to, I've already kind of beat this one to death, but as you iterate, you're going to do that feedback loop, know and improve your process. Uh, but I think a big one here, and, and this has been said multiple times today as well, but define what success means for, for your project. It, it does no good to go into a project if you don't know what the success is. Uh, how are you going to sit at the end at the, of that first iteration or each iteration and know if you've been successful if you haven't defined what success means? So publish it as a part of your requirements. What are your success criteria? Measure it with each iteration. Where am I in my success criteria? So if I, if I publish what that success criteria is, I hopefully can come up with a way to measure that. Where am I uh, in my success criteria? And if you can, understand your return on investment. So we've seen a lot of great statistics today uh, of where you are uh, how many templates you're using, how many documents you're generating. Uh, that's all ways to measure your success in your project. As you iterate, simplify your process where you can, right? So don't, you're going to get this feedback loop and you're going to get a lot of feedback and then the, the tendency is sometimes if I'm iterating that often, I'm getting all that feedback, well, I'm going to add this and this and this and this into my process. See what you really need to add to your process and what you need to change. Uh, make those decisions uh, uh, very carefully so that you don't overcomplicate. Finally, have a launch plan. So publicize, 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 publicize a lot. And then do it some more. Um, internally and externally. So I, I just think this is key. Uh, uh, Paul er, early on today talked about the fact that they're, you know, the, the big failure they had with the project that uh, must not be named. Uh, but then when they had success, what they've done is very early on, they go out and they talk to the end users, even before the implementation. Publicize what's coming. Publicize when it's coming. Publicize after it's come uh, internally. Make sure there's good documentation internally. Uh, externally, uh, there's something that really drives success from our project team from getting some um, recognition, both internally and externally. It's just a simple press release sometimes of, hey, we did this and this is what it brought to our business, uh, does wonders for the team that's actually in the weeds building that content and working on that automation. So have a launch plan that includes pub uh, publicizing as a part of it. Uh, that, that's critical. Uh, and in your vendor, if you're working with a vendor, Legito or whoever it may be on whatever project, they certainly appreciate the external uh, public, uh, publications as well. Uh, it helps them and it builds your relationship with them as a vendor. Uh, properly time your training. So uh, one of the don'ts I see, that I see is training too early. So if, if part of your implementation plan you're using third party services to do some of your automation for you, don't train and then have them go off and build all the templates and then they give them to you three months later. That might not be the right timeline, but, but if you trained three months and they didn't touch it until three months later, then you wasted a lot of time and effort on training because they really need that training when they're going to start getting access into the tool and using it. Uh, so just think about that in your project plan as well. And then leverage your successes uh, of, of previous launches of whatever other implementation you may have done. So with that, uh, while you're doing it, you do all this work. It feels like a roller coaster ride and uh, you have a choice. Do you sit on the roller coaster like this or do you throw your hands up and you enjoy the ride? Uh, it is a journey uh, really as we go through these implementations. I think everybody in this room is experiencing it. Uh, enjoy it. Right? Make sure that you, you get some enjoyment out of that journey as well. So I appreciate your time today and uh, thank you very much.